Welcome to this collection of five weird and wonderful science fiction short stories. I'll be narrating The Sloths of Crovney by Vern Fearing, The Old Goat by Charles L. Fontenay, A Little Journey by Ray Bradbury, In the Jagwiffing Service by David R. Bunch, and Big Stoop by Charles V. DeVette. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. The Sloths of Crovney by Vern Fearing Narrated by William Skye Bradley Broadshoulders, friends call him Brad, or Broad, or Shoulders, stood grim-lipped as is the custom of spacemen, and waited for the commander to speak fateful words. He was an obese youth, fully five feet tall, without a shred of muscle, but he wore the green tunic of the Galaxy Patrol proudly, and his handsome bony head boasted a tidy crop of Venusian fungus. His gleaming eyes gleamed. Brad! We are in a tough fix, the commander said suddenly. His name was Metanik, known also as Foxy Grandpa. He had spoken in capitals all over Europe and continued the practice since. We are up against it, he went on. The fate of the world may be at stake. What's wrong, chief? asked Brad jauntily. Plenty, roared Metanik. Nobody's attacking the earth. That's what's wrong. Nobody is out to conquer the universe. How come, may I ask? Brad gulped. Could he believe his ears? No one attacking good, kind old Earth? Was there nothing in which a man could pin his faith, let alone his ears? Were they indeed his ears? He turned to his best friend, Ugg, who stood behind him. Would he stand behind him? Did he realise they were on the verge of a mission? Ugg was a pastiche, or intermezzo, a cross between a Martian and a Texan, as loathsome and stupid a combination as one could wish. Why he was Brad's best friend was a mystery. Squarely, he met Brad's gaze, which left him an eye to spare. It winked, and Brad shuddered. It was an omen. I want to know why, the commander shouted. You have your secret orders. Off with you. A really fat omen. The good ship, Locke's wing, was almost ready to go. She was a fine, spaceworthy craft, Brad knew. Just the same, it was disconcerting to see rats deserting her by the thousand. Not that he missed them. Some were sure to return as soon as Ugg appeared on the scene. He seemed to fascinate them. Just then, the rats paused. Sure enough, Ugg was coming. He was reeling. He had apparently made the rounds, as is the custom of spacemen, swilling vast quantities of airplane dope, and he was high as a kite. Brad glommed him glumly in the gloaming, with more than a glimmer of gloomy foreboding. It was wrong, he thought. All wrong. If only it hadn't been too late to turn back but it wasn't. They hadn't even started yet. If anything, it was too early. There was no way out. He entered the spaceship with a sigh. Sai, whose whole name was Silas Mariner, shook his hand weakly, muttered, Remember the albatross, and tottered out. It was an omen. Presently, Brad and Ugg were blasting off. As the cigar-shaped vessel rose to the starry void, spacemen, their visages lined and tanned like cigars, held their cigars aloft in silent salute, and gently flicked their ashes, while softly a cigar band played, Maracas, why you no love me no more? Two days out, Brad summoned Ugg. How fast are we going? Oh, say, thirty thousand miles an hour? Brad calculated rapidly and put down his abacus. At this rate, it will take us fourteen years just to get out of our own lousy solar system, he barked. Faster! Ugg said, yes, sir, and vice versa. Then he upped the speed to 186,000 miles per second and came back and shyly told Brad. Brad said, Bah! We'll be 70 years reaching the Big Dipper! Faster! But nothing can go any faster, protested Ugg. According to Einstein... To hell with Einstein! roared Brad. Is he paying your salary? So they went faster. The ship sped onward, unless it was upward, to fulfil its mission. Again and again Brad found himself wondering where he was going. The mission was a real stiff. He knew only that since there was practically no life anywhere in the solar system, except for good, kind old Earth, Earth had seen to that, anyone attacking Earth, or not doing so, was obviously somewhere in outer space. But here the trail ended. Courage, he told himself, courage. After all, was he not the grandson of Pierre Fromage, inventor of the rubber band motor? With a start, he realised he was not. 
His own heritage, while covered with peculiar glory, was a more tragic one, the spacemen's heritage. The broad shoulders were brave, but things happened to them. His grandfather, a traffic officer, had chased a comet for speeding and had, unfortunately, overtaken it. His father had been spared the fire, but one day, aboard his spaceship, someone spilled a glass of water. The gravity was off at the time, and the water just hung there in mid-air until Brad's father walked into it and drowned. What would be his own end, he wondered. What other way was there to die? Just then, through the bulkhead, he could hear Ugg swinging in his hammock, playing the violin. He wondered if the rats were dancing, like the last time he'd surprised him. Another thought was on the way, something about rats and a new way to die, but Brad was already asleep, mercifully having a nightmare. It was the morning of the fifth day when the emergency alarm, EA, was suddenly activated. Instantly a host of automatic devices went off. One turned on the fan, another blew the fuses, a third made the beds. Bells clanged and bugles sounded every call from battle stations, BS, to abandoned ship, JR. Brad and Ugg slept through it all. Nothing was wrong, except with the emergency alarm, EA. It wore itself out and the eventful voyage continued. Brad woke on the ninth day. The two-day pill he'd taken on the third day had evidently done its work well. He was rested. He felt optimistic again. When he looked out the porthole, he could see plenty of space for improvement. But what was that? There, half obscured in a tumbling, swirly mass of misty grey clouds, he could make out something white. He pressed his nose against the porthole and strained his eyes. It gave him the feeling of peering into a bendix, as is the custom of spacemen. His mouth went damp dry. This was it. Whatever it was. Ugh! he shouted, all agog. Ugh! Ugh! Ugh dashed in, wheeling a large kaleidoscope. Expertly, they read the directions and trained it on the mysterious formation. The indicator turned pale. By the ring-tailed dog star of Sirius! barked Brad. Why, it's nothing more than an enormous skull stone revolving in space! This is Sirius! barked Ugg. That's what I barked, snapped Brad. And don't ask me whose it is. It's big enough to support life, that's the main issue. Prepare to land. A strange yet resplendent civilization, thought Brad, looking out at a sunlit landscape, or gaulscape, of molten gold. The houses, stylish igloos and mosques, were sturdily constructed of three-ply cardboard and driftwood. Before each house, mysteriously, stood a berber pole of solid peppermint. Brad and Ugg bounded out of their ship. The two bounders stood there, encased in heat-resistant Pyrex pants, expecting the natives to make things hot for them. Dumbfounded at the delay, they waited for the attack to commence. It did not. I never, said Brad presently. If we needed proof, we've got it. Such a display of indolence is testimony enough that these people are responsible for not attacking Earth. We shall have to use stratemagy. Swiftly, he took off his pants, revealing underneath the red flannel costume of a 17th century French courtier, complete with powdered wig and a full staff. Ugg ran up a flag emblazoned with the legend, Diplomacy and Agriculture, then planted beans all around the ship, while Brad postured and danced the minuet. The clever scheme worked beautifully. Soon an old man began circling them on a bicycle, keeping a safe distance. Clearly he was someone of importance, for his long white beard was carefully braided and coiled in a delivery basket on the handlebars. Furthermore, he wore a glowing circlet on his forehead, so that Brad knew he was able to read their minds, if they had any. How about throwing us a couple circlets? Brad cried. Instead, the old man, who was hard of hearing, flung them a couple cutlets, which worked even better and had protein besides. Thus fortified, they were escorted to the palace. Some moments earlier, Brad had learned first, that Krovny was the name of this unusual culture, and second, that the High Krov himself, attended by all his nobles, would see him. Brad had then entered the Krov chamber, or trapeze room, and he had learned nothing since. It was all true, he told himself. The High Krov was hanging by his toes from a trapeze, and so were all his nobles. The only difference was that the High Krov's trapeze was more ornate than the rest. Yes, said Brad to himself. It was all true. He had been shaking and punching his head, and nothing had changed. I come, he said, from a far away land. Shut up, cried the crove. Who cares? At this, the old man, who was still on his bicycle, whispered to Brad. 
They've all got headaches, he nodded, stroking his beard sage brushly. It's all part of a great cosmic era, a tragedy played among the spiral nebulae, to the hollow ringing laughter of the gods. You see, we sloths are only half the population of Crovny, he went on. On the other side of our world live the Sidemen, or Sad Sacks. Legend has it that eons ago the Sidemen were mistakenly delivered a cargo of saxophones from Sax Fifth Avenue. The old man's voice was hushed as he added, They have been practicing ever since. I see, said Brad. And that accounts for the headaches here? Small wonder, said the old man. I bless the day I went deaf. But why do they do it? asked Brad. The Sidemen? They're trying to drive us off from the ranch. The planet, I mean. You see, they claim they made this hoarder and gallstone themselves. Made it? asked Brad dully. Uh-huh. The old man spat Mercurian tobacco juice. Just like on Earth, where myriad minute oceanic organisms pile their skeletons to form coral islands. You see, the side men eat radishes, love them in fact, but it gives them gallstones. They claim this whole world is the collected gallstones of their ancestors. The old man wiped Mercurian tobacco juice from his beard and shoes. Kind of a hard claim to beat, he opined. I see, said Brad. That explains the misty swirling clouds all round this planet, and why it's seldom visible. You follow me? Yep, said the old man. It's gas. Them radishes will turn on you every time. Suddenly the high crove began to sob. Now you see, don't you? Why we haven't attacked Earth? A body can't keep his mind on anything around here. I asked for a few secret weapons, and what did I get? He was blubbering now. Oh, I tried, I tried. Appropriations and all that. You may be sure we lined our pockets, but after years of stalling, they showed up with two weapons they swore were terrible enough to put an end to war. One of them was a war pistol. I see, said Brad. And the other? A ray gun. Brad's eyes brightened. A ray gun? May I see how it works? Indeed you may. A platoon of maroon dragoons dragged in a queer apparatus. It looked like a medieval cannon with a Victorian phonograph speaker flaring from its business end. The dragoons ranged around the weapon, keeping their backs to it. One of them clutched the firing lanyard. There was a pause, a brittle silence. Then the lanyard snapped. Ray! shouted the ray gun. What was that? asked Brad. Twice more the lanyard snapped. The ray gun boomed. Ray! Ray! You mean all it does is shout Ray? asked Brad. Well, it can also shout Max, said the old man. Fearful, ain't it? Yes, said Brad. He took a piece of old parchment from a breast pocket. This, he stated, is the original deed to Manhattan. Notice here on the bottom where it says $24. I am signing it over to you, he signed with a flourish. Now you have a legal claim, a crusade, and a nice piece of property. Go get it. But the headaches, cried the old man. Cool, man, cool, said Brad. I'll mix a bromo. Is it habit forming? cried the high crow. Not a bit, said Brad, mixing it. Simply take one an hour, forever. And now I must bid you farewell. Wait, cried the crow. Don't you want to take my lovely daughter back with you? Brad looked at her. She was lovely. She had scales, but she was lovely. She had magnificent blonde hair, some of it almost an inch long, none of it on her head, but she was lovely. Well, said Brad hesitatingly. He had his eyes glued on her. When he took them off, they made a noise like vacuum cups. Fop! Your mother won't like her, whispered Ugg. Well, said Brad. He could feel duty tugging inside. Not for him, the pipe and slippers. He was one of Spaceway's men. He would go to the spaceman's way, off into Wayman's space. Wayman, not women, he told himself sternly. The call of the ether, the vacuous void, the black velvet wastes, the outspread cloak of the universe dripping with stardust. The undreamt of galaxies. These were the things by which he lived. Well, said Brad. Come on, said Ugg. We'll only fight over her. Slowly they bounded back to their spaceship. The ship sped backward, headed for Earth. It was days before the mistake was discovered, and this alone spared their lives. For had they completed their journey on schedule? But why be morbid? The fact is, the Earth blew up. What a sight. The whole thing, whirling one minute like the globe in Miss Fogarty's geography supply closet, the next minute, whammo! Gee, said Ugg soberly, guess we're lucky, huh? Well, 
said Brad. He hadn't said anything else for days, but he didn't seem well at all. Funny, he thought. They promise you if you go on working, work hard and don't fool around, don't ask questions, just do your job, everything will come your way. The next thing, they're all dead and there's nobody to complain to even. Was it selfish to think of one's career at a time like this? No, he told himself. It was all he knew. The patrol was all that mattered. He did some rapid calculation. They were far off the interplanetary travel lanes. Their fuel supply was down to a single can of kerosene. Food for perhaps two days remained. As he listened to Ugg tuning his violin, scarcely audible over the squeakings and squealings that filled the spaceship, he realised that the only solution, the only thing that could save them or the future of Earthmen, was for a shipload of beautiful dames to rescue them within the next 36 hours. He figured the odds against this to be 50 billion to one. But Brad had fought big odds before. Grim-lipped, he shaved. The Old Goat by Charles L. Fontenay It's been said that the soul is the form that makes the body, which may just possibly explain what happened on that fateful day at Ivy College. Dr. Angstrom was known to his students and many of his colleagues on the faculty as the Old Goat. Very appropriate, that name. He had the disposition of a goat with dyspepsia, he had the cold blue eyes of a goat, he had the waggling whiskers of a goat. Perhaps it's in memory of Dr. Angstrom that Ivy College has a goat for its mascot now. Dr. Angstrom was even more goatish than usual that day last summer, when half a dozen top scientists in the field gathered to see his preview experiment on matter transmission of a live animal. He had been working hard for weeks on the transmitter, and keeping up classes at the same time, which did not improve his disposition. Besides, he had a real goat for an experimental animal, and goats are notoriously hard on the nervous system. This particular animal, at the moment the scientists entered, was straining at his rope, trying to get a mouthful of a tablecloth which graced a nearby table full of jars and retorts. Failing this, the goat exhibited that typical lack of discrimination in matters edible, and began to chew on his rope. I felt a little out of place among all these giant brains. My reason for being there was that I had been serving, during my college career, as sort of a factotum and fetching carry man for Dr. Angstrom, and I was to take notes for him. I had acquired considerable affection for the old goat. Maybe that's one reason I hate to see his great scientific work kept under wraps, because people still insist it's dangerous. I have proved to my own satisfaction that the matter transmitter works, Dr. Angstrom told the assembled scientists. I have made a number of transmissions of inanimate matter. In theory, it should work just as well for animate objects, and I have invited you to be present at the first test of this theory. I need not go into detail with you about the basic theory of matter transmission. The transmitter itself picks up the atomic and electronic image of the object inside it, much as a television scanner picks up a scene, except that it is done in three dimensions instead of two. This is made possible by the four-dimensional element, which is the heart of the apparatus, and was made available to us through recent intra-atomic research. The receiver picks up the image as a television receiver does, except again in three dimensions. The matter is not duplicated because the transmitter strips down the object within it as it transmits. Now, the question that has been raised by some scientists about the transmission of animate objects is whether the soul or life force can be transmitted. I consider this question ridiculous, and will prove it so. It is my contention that such life force is not a thing apart from the physical shell. The matter transmitter was a large closed cylinder on one side of the room. The receiver was a similar cylinder on the other. Both were raised slightly from the floor. As sort of hors d'oeuvre, Dr. Angstrom transmitted a large chunk of lead across the room, then a glass jar. In each case, the object was placed in the transmitter, and a moment later removed from the receiver across the room. There was no possible way for it to have been moved across the intervening space except by broadcast transmission. "'As you see,' said Dr. Angstrom, "'I have eliminated the necessity for a switch by building the switch into the door of the transmitter. As soon as the door is closed, transmission occurs.' Now we shall send our animate object. He untied the goat and, with some difficulty, hauled the animal by its collar to the transmitter. There the goat balked and Dr. Angstrom, having got its head through the door, got behind it and shoved heartily, hanging on to the edge of the door so he could shut it quickly when the goat was inside. As goats will, the goat suddenly changed its mind and leaped into the transmitter. Caught off balance, Dr. Angstrom fell in after it, 
and the door, given a last frantic jerk, slammed on them both. There were gasps of horror and alarm from the scientist, but I held up my hand to calm them. "'There's no danger, gentlemen,' I said. "'It's just as well this way. I happen to know that Dr. Angstrom's next step, after proving to you with a goat that animate objects could be transmitted, was to prove that human beings also could be transmitted. He planned to be his own first subject.' With serene confidence, I went to the receiver and threw open the door. Just as I had anticipated, the goat leaped out, unharmed, followed by Dr. Angstrom. "'I told you animate objects could be transmitted successfully,' said the goat triumphantly. "Bah!" said Dr. Angstrom, and began eating the tablecloth. If you're enjoying the stories, please activate the like button for this video. It helps me create more content like this. A Little Journey by Ray Bradbury Narrated by William Skye She'd paid good money to see the inevitable, and then had to work to make it happen. There were two important things. One, that she was very old. Two, that Mr. Thurkle was taking her to God. For hadn't he patted her hand and said, Mrs. Bellows will take off into space in my rocket and go to find him together. And that was how it was going to be. Oh, this wasn't like any other group Mrs. Bellows had ever joined. In her fervour to light a path for her delicate, tottering feet, she had struck matches down dark alleys and found her way to Hindu mystics who floated their flickering, starry eyelashes over crystal balls. She had walked on the meadow paths with ascetic Indian philosophers, imported by daughters in spirit, of Madame Blavatsky. She had made pilgrimages to California's stucco jungles to hunt the astrological seer in his natural habitat. She had even consented to signing away the rights to one of her homes in order to be taken into the shouting order of a temple of amazing evangelists who had promised her golden smoke, crystal fire, and the great soft hand of God coming to bear her home. None of these people had ever shaken Mrs. Bellow's faith even when she saw them sirened away in a black wagon in the night, or discovered their pictures, bleak and unromantic, in the morning tabloids. The world had roughed them up and locked them away, because they knew too much, that was all. And then, two weeks ago, she had seen Mr. Thurkle's advertisement in New York City. Come to Mars! Stay at the Thurkle Restorium for one week, and then on into space on the greatest adventure life can offer! Send for free pamphlet, Nearer My God to Thee. Excursion rates. Round trip slightly lower. Round trip? Mrs. Bellows had thought. But who would come back after seeing him? And so she had bought a ticket and flown off to Mars and spent seven mild days at Mr. Thurkle's Restorium, the building with a sign on it which flashed, Thurkle's Rocket to Heaven! She had spent the week bathing in limpid waters and erasing the care from her tiny bones, and now she was fidgeting, ready to be loaded into Mr. Thurkle's own special private rocket, like a bullet, to be fired on out into space beyond Jupiter and Saturn and Pluto. And thus, who could deny it, you would be getting nearer and nearer to the Lord. How wonderful! Couldn't you just feel him drawing near? Couldn't you just sense his breath, his scrutiny, his presence? Here I am, said Mrs. Bellows, an ancient rickety elevator, ready to go up the shaft. God need only press the button. Now, on the seventh day, as she minced up the steps of the restorium, a number of small doubts assailed her. For one thing, she said aloud to no one, it isn't quite the land of milk and honey here on Mars that they said it would be. My room is like a cell. The swimming pool is really quite inadequate, and besides, how many widows who look like mushrooms or skeletons want to swim? And finally, the whole restorium smells of boiled cabbage and tennis shoes. She opened the front door and let it slam, somewhat irritably. She was amazed at the other women in the auditorium. It was like wandering in a carnival mirror maze, coming again and again upon yourself the same flowery face, the same chicken hands and jingling bracelets. One after another of the images of herself floated before her. She put out her hand, but it wasn't a mirror. It was another lady shaking her fingers and saying, We're waiting for Mr. Thurkle. Shh. Ah, whispered everyone. The velvet curtains parted.
Mr. Thurkle appeared, fantastically serene, his Egyptian eyes upon everyone. But there was something, nevertheless, in his appearance, which made one expect him to call, Hi! while fuzzy dogs jumped over his legs, through his hooped arms and over his back. Then, dogs and all, he should dance with a dazzling piano-keyboard smile off into the wings. Mrs. Bellows, with a secret part of her mind which she constantly had to grip tightly, expected to hear a cheap Chinese gong sound when Mr. Thurkle entered. His large, liquid, dark eyes were so improbable that one of the old ladies had facetiously claimed she saw a mosquito cloud hovering over them, as they did around summer rain barrels. And Mrs. Bellows sometimes caught the scent of the theatrical mothball and the smell of calliope steam on his sharply pressed suit. But with the same savage rationalisation that had greeted all other disappointments in her rickety life, she bit at the suspicion and whispered, This time it's real. This time it'll work. Haven't we got a rocket? Mr. Thurkle bowed. He smiled a sudden comedy mask smile. The old ladies looked in at his epiglottis and sensed chaos there. Before he even began to speak, Mrs. Bellows saw him picking up each of his words, oiling it, making sure it ran smooth on its rails. Her heart squeezed in like a tiny fist, and she gritted her porcelain teeth. Friends, said Mr. Thurkle, and you could hear the frost snap in the hearts of the entire assemblage. No, said Mrs. Bellows ahead of time. She could hear the bad news rushing at her, and herself tied to the track while the immense black wheels threatened and the whistle screamed helpless. There will be a slight delay, said Mr. Thurkle. In the next instant, Mr. Thurkle might have cried, or been tempted to cry, Ladies, be seated, in minstrel fashion, for the ladies had come up at him from their chairs, protesting and trembling. Not a very long delay, Mr. Thurkle put up his hands to pat the air. How long? Only a week. A week? Yes, you can stay here at the Restorium for seven more days, can't you? A little delay won't matter, will it, in the end? You've waited a lifetime. Only a few more days. At twenty dollars a day, thought Mrs. Bellows coldly. What's the trouble? a woman cried. A legal difficulty, said Mr. Thurkle. We've a rocket, haven't we? Well, yes. I've been here a whole month waiting, said one old lady. Delays, delays. That's right, said everyone. Ladies, ladies, murmured Mr. Thurkle, smiling serenely. We want to see the rocket! It was Mrs. Bellows forging ahead, alone, brandishing her fist like a toy hammer. Mr. Thurkle looked into the old lady's eyes, a missionary among albino cannibals. Well, now, he said. Yes, now, cried Mrs. Bellows. I'm afraid, he began. So am I, she said. That's why we want to see the ship. No, no, now, Mrs... He snapped his fingers for her name. Bellows, she cried. She was a small container, but now all the seething pressures that had been built up over long years came steaming through the delicate vents of her body. Her cheeks became incandescent. With a wail that was like a melancholy factory whistle, Mrs. Bellows ran forward and hung to him, almost by her teeth like a summer maddened spitz. She would not, and never could, let go until he died, and the other women followed, jumping and yapping like a pound let loose on its trainer, the same one who had petted them and to whom they had squirmed and whined joyfully an hour before, now milling about him, creasing his sleeves and frightening the Egyptian serenity from his gaze. "'This way!' cried Mrs. Bellows, feeling like Madame Lafarge. "'Through the back! We've waited long enough to see the ship!' Every day he's put us off. Every day we've waited. Now let's see. No, no, ladies, cried Mr. Thurkle, leaping about. They burst through the back of the stage and out a door, like a flood, bearing the poor man with them into a shed, and then out, quite suddenly, into an abandoned gymnasium. There it is, said someone. The rocket. And then a silence fell that was terrible to entertain. There was the rocket. Mrs. Bellows looked at it, and her hand sagged away from Mr. Thurkle's collar. The rocket was something like a battered copper pot. There were a thousand bulges and rents and rusty pipes and dirty vents on and in it. The ports were clouded over with dust, resembling the eyes of a blind hog. Everyone wailed a little sighing wail. Is that the rocket ship? Glory be to the highest? cried Mrs. Bellows, appalled. 
Mr. Thurkle nodded and looked at his feet. For which we've paid out our one thousand dollars apiece and came all the way to Mars to get on board with you and go off to find him? asked Mrs. Bellows. Why, that isn't worth a sack of dried peas, said Mrs. Bellows. It's nothing but junk. Junk, whispered everyone, getting hysterical. Don't let him get away! Mr. Thurkle tried to break and run, but a thousand possum traps closed on him from every side. He withered. Everybody walked around in circles like blind mice. There was a confusion and a weeping that went on for five minutes as they went over and touched the rocket, the dented kettle, the rusty container for God's children. Well, said Mrs. Bellows. She stepped up into the askew doorway of the rocket and faced everyone. It looks as if a terrible thing has been done to us, she said. I haven't any money to go back home to Earth, and I've too much pride to go to the government and tell them a common man like this has fooled us out of our life's savings. I don't know how you feel about it, all of you, but the reason all of us came is because I'm 85, and you're 89, and you're 78, and all of us are nudging on toward 100, and there's nothing on Earth for us, and it doesn't appear there's anything on Mars either. We all expected not to breathe much more air, or crochet many more doilies, or we'd never have come here. So what I have to propose is a simple thing. To take a chance. She reached out and touched the rusted hulk of the rocket. This is our rocket. We paid for our trip, and we're going to take our trip. Everyone rustled and stood on tiptoes and opened an astonished mouth. Mr. Thurkle began to cry. He did it quite easily and very effectively. We're going to get in this ship, said Mrs. Bellows, ignoring him, and we're going to take off to where we were going. Mr. Thurkle stopped crying long enough to say, But it was all a fake. I don't know anything about space. He's not out there anyway. I lied. I don't know where he is, and I couldn't find him if I wanted to. And you are fools to ever take my word on it. Yes, said Mrs. Bellows. We were fools. I'll go along on that. But you can't blame us, for we're old, and it was a lovely, good and fine idea. One of the loveliest ideas in the world. Oh, we didn't really fool ourselves that we could get nearer to him physically. It was the gentle, mad dream of old people, the kind of thing you hold on to for a few minutes a day, even though you know it's not true. So, all of you who want to go, you follow me in the ship. But you can't go, said Mr. Thurkle. You haven't got a navigator, and that ship's a ruin. You, said Mrs. Bellows, will be the navigator. She stepped into the ship, and after a moment the other old ladies pressed forward. Mr. Thurkle, windmilling his arms frantically, was nevertheless pressed through the port, and in a minute the door slammed shut. Mr. Thurkle was strapped into the navigator's seat, with everyone talking at once and holding him down. The special helmets were issued to be fitted over every grey or white head to supply extra oxygen in case of a leakage in the ship's hull, and at long last the hour had come, and Mrs. Bellows stood behind Mr. Thurkle and said, "'We're ready, sir.' He said nothing. He pleaded with them silently, using his great, dark, wet eyes, but Mrs. Bellows shook her head and pointed to the control. "'Take off.' agreed Mr. Thurkle morosely, and pulled a switch. Everybody fell. The rocket went up from the planet Mars in a great fiery glide, with the noise of an entire kitchen thrown down an elevator shaft, with the sound of pots and pans and kettles and fires boiling and stews bubbling, with a smell of burned incense and rubber and sulphur, with a colour of yellow fire and a ribbon of red stretching below them, and all the old women singing and holding to each other and Mrs. Bellows crawling upright in the sighing, straining, trembling ship. "'Head for space, Mr. Thurkle.' "'It can't last,' said Mr. Thurkle sadly. "'This ship can't last. It will—' It did. The rocket exploded. Mrs. Bellows felt herself lifted and thrown about dizzily, like a doll. She heard the great screamings, and saw the flashes of bodies sailing by her in fragments of metal and powdery light. Help! Help! cried Mr. Thurkle, far away on a small radio beam. The ship disintegrated into a million parts, and the old ladies, all one hundred of them, were flung straight on ahead with the same velocity as the ship. As for Mr. Thurkle, for some reason of trajectory, perhaps, he had been blown out the other side of the ship. Mrs. Bellows saw him falling separate and away from them, screaming, screaming. There goes Mr. Thurkle, thought Mrs. Bellows, and she knew where he was going. He was going to be burned and roasted and broiled good, but very good. Mr. Thurkle was falling down into the sun. 
And here we are, thought Mrs. Bellows. Here we are, going on out, and out, and out. There was hardly a sense of motion at all, but she knew that she was travelling at fifty thousand miles an hour, and would continue to travel at that speed for an eternity, until... She saw the other women swinging all about her in their own trajectories. A few minutes of oxygen left to each of them in their helmets, and each was looking up to where they were going. Of course, thought Mrs. Bellows. Out into space. Out and out, and the darkness like a great church, and the stars like candles. And in spite of everything, Mr. Thurkle, the rocket, and the dishonesty, we are going toward the Lord. And there, yes, there, as she fell on and on, coming toward her, she could almost discern the outline now. Coming toward her was his mighty golden hand, reaching down to hold her and comfort her like a frightened sparrow. I'm Mrs. Amelia Bellows, she said quietly, in her best company voice. I'm from the planet Earth. In the Jagwiffing Service by David R. Bunch Narrated by William Skye The jag stuff in those black rings was wonderful, but why did they have to package it with so many extra accessories? I had always said there was an easier way, and I think when we invade, I'll be proved right. But you know how things get started, and how powerful tradition can be, and how old line thinking can keep people, even a whole planet, in a rut. The big cargo sources were getting bigger and bigger each year, what with the growing popularity of the Jagwiff places, and the Jagwiff places themselves were growing in number, with more and more people going on the Jag because, well, partly because of troubles in the sky, like strange balls whirling around and unexplainable objects going beep and woof and woof woof. We of the saucers had slipped past these first baby objects okay, and knew they were just little old harmless ping-pongs that chattered a little now and then, like a greeting going past. But tell the people that. They'd throw a big glass on one of the whirlers and see spikes sticking out, and maybe a big pair of eyes inside and a nose and a long red tongue hanging down. The earth it's, they'd scream like they'd just fallen into one of the hot canals, and they'd race off to a jag with jag like Judgment Day of Sins itself was after them. And the funny part of it is, I guess the people were right being scared like that, the way things turned out. But is it any wonder we were having to increase the size of the saucers to space all all that jagwiff up through the rattleballs? And a big reason makes me think it could have been done more efficiently. We were having to take so much junk stuff, extra accessories I guess you'd call it, to get the jagwiff. Our earth it contacts were always giving us the old breeze about cost of labour, cost of materials, improvement in design and next year's inventories. Apparently the dealers didn't understand at all what the play was with us, because they'd give us so much blab-blab that didn't apply, all about futuristic design and how one Jagwiffer machine had it all over another Jagwiffer machine, which to us didn't mean a thing. And we didn't talk, because we'd heard already how some Earthits feared the saucers, and how some Earthits said they didn't exist at all, and how some other Earthits were on the fence, saying maybe they did, maybe they didn't, so what? And how there was wide fear and great unrest among the Earthits in general. And when it's like that, and you're a possible source of the wide fear and unrest, a whole planet full of people can easily decide they don't want any part of contributing to your pleasure. And that's what the Jagwiff was to us, actually. Pleasure. Back home, when our troubles had us down, or maybe we just felt like raising a little dust, we'd go to a Jagwiff place. We'd plunk down our pay pictures, and the whiff tender would wheel out one of those black rings which they have to keep under special pressures in our climate. Then he'd screw on the tube with the face piece, and we'd take our whiff and something out of the black ring, just seemed like real thick chest filler to me, would spread all through to the farthest reaches of our breath bags and go into our blood, and suddenly all five of our eye sticks would start whirling and focusing and zeroing in for dames, and our arms and legs would start a kick and a slap dance, enough to shake the planet down. And when our face spines and head tubes would go into that special sharp buzz of contentment, we'd know we were on our jag, full and warm and happy with as much pleasure as any Martian is ever supposed to know. But we never revealed the play to our earthed contacts, just slipped in at night in our noiseless saucers with all lights dimmed, cleared our cargo tubes of the tons of pay picture we'd bought, green copy of the earth its currency, and took on as many of the gleaming Jagwiffer machines as our cargo tubes would hold. But it is ten years now since a Jagwiffer captain has steered his saucer through the whirling balls, it got so the satellites would drum on the saucer from a long way out. Deafening. Dreadful. We saw what was coming, and we tried to beat it. 
We saucered around the clock for a while, trying to stockpile enough jagwith to last us, but of course we couldn't. We are about out of it now, and our land is strewn with the glittery shells that were once attached to the black tubes of the jagwith. And it could have all been done so different. I'm sure it could. That stuff wasn't just in the tubes of the Jagwiffer machines down there, I'm convinced of that. That stuff may have been all around us down there. I believe it was. But our government would insist we get into these suits, about so far out, you see, about the time we'd start contacting the Rattleballs. And they threatened us with removal of the contacts if we broke the rules about the suits. In addition to that, they said we'd die anyway. So you see how life can be. Grim and fuzzy and unsafe most of the time. And to make things even more uncertain, just because they couldn't duplicate the product we were hauling, our scientists got uppity and ignored the whole problem. Except to run off to the Jagwiff places, of course, to ease their frustrations, which they did plenty often when they thought they wouldn't be seen. But when we invade down there, which we plan to do soon now, with our special equipment to catch and explode the whirly balls, I think we're going to find out plenty. Among other things, I think we're going to find out that the stuff we cargoed up here at such great cost that was so inefficiently packaged, is all around us down there. I think when we take over down there, with the right filtering equipment, jagwiffing may become as common and economical as breathing. And another thing. I think we're going to find out we were taken for quite a ride by the Earthits with their silly way of packaging jagwiff. Imagine having to buy all that chrome and steel, guaranteed to go over 100 miles an hour, just to get four little black rings of whiff. And for all the Earthits talked about it, The rings with the white sidewalls didn't whiff one bit better than the others. Big Stoop by Charles V. DeVette Narrated by William Skye Smart man Bruckner, he knew how to handle natives. But they knew even better how to deal with smart terrestrials. Bruckner was a man deeply imbued with a sense of his own worth. Now as he rested his broad beam on the joined arms of Sweets and Majeski, he winked to include them in a This is necessary, but you and I see the humour of the thing. Understanding. Like most thoroughly disliked men, he considered himself quite popular with the boys. The conceited hams enjoying this, Sweets thought, as he staggered down the aisle under the big man's weight. At the ship's entrance, he glanced out across the red sand plain, to where the natives waited. They wore little clothing, Sweets noted, except the chief. He sat on his dais, carried on the shoulders of eight of his followers, dressed in long streamers of multicoloured ribbons. Other ribbons, rolled into a rope, formed a diadem on his head. The only man more impressively dressed was Bruckner. He wore all the ceremonial trappings of a second-century Gallic king, complete with jewel-studded gold crown. As Sweets and Majeski grunted with their burden across the ten yards separating the ship from the throne-like chair that had been brought out earlier, their feet kicked up a cloud of red dust that coated their clothing and clogged their nostrils. The dust had originally been red ferric sand, but the action of winds and storms had milled it together, grain against grain, through the ages, until it had become a fine red powder that hung in the hot still air after they had passed. Most of Waterfield's planet, they had discovered on their inspection flight the day before, had been a desert for more centuries than they could accurately estimate. Its oases, however, were large and plentiful, and, as observed from the air, followed a clear-cut regular pattern. The obvious conclusion was that they were fed by underground rivers. The crewmen deposited their burden in the chair and stood waiting. "'Nice work, men,' Bruckner muttered in an undertone. Now keep up the act, bow from the waist and retire discreetly to the background. Majeski said something under his breath as they complied. The greeting ceremony got off to a good start after that, Sweets had to admit. Whatever else might be said of Bruckner, he knew his job as a psychologist. Bruckner rose to his feet, raised his right hand, palm forward, and intoned gravely, Earthmen greet you. He spoke in the language of the natives. The tribal chieftain raised his hand negligently in reply, but neither rose nor spoke. With a great display of magnanimity, Bruckner sent over a bolt of bright red cloth. The chieftain accepted the gift and sent back a large wooden box carried by two of his men. They lowered the box at Bruckner's feet, and one of them opened a door on its side. The large animal, or bird, the earthman couldn't be certain which, 
that stepped out stood about seven feet tall, with a body shaped like a bowling pin. It walked on webbed feet that angled outward, had short flippers, set low on a body covered with coarse hair that might have been feathers, and was armed with long, vicious claws. There was something so ludicrous about its appearance that Sweets had difficulty stifling the chuckle that rose in his throat. The animal, however, took itself very seriously. When it saw its audience, the spaceship's crew, watching, it took two spraddling steps forward, pulled the bulk of its pot-bellied stomach up into its chest, and paused dramatically. It gave three very loud, hoarse burps, somewhere between the squawk of a duck and the braying of an ass. It was a hilariously funny caricature of a pompous orator. Someone snickered. Immediately, Sweets and the other crew members joined in the laughter. It was the kind of belly laughing that could not be restrained. While he roared, Sweets took time to observe Bruckner. At the first outbreak of laughter, the psychologist scowled and glanced nervously across at the natives. But when he saw that they too had joined in the laughter, he allowed himself to smile condescendingly. The meeting ended with much apparent goodwill on both sides. Well, I guess we knew what we were doing, didn't we? Bruckner said after they were back in the ship. He made a point of emphasising the we. At the time Waterfield's planet was first discovered, he explained, the official report was that the natives were friendly. However, when the survey team landed a year later, they ran into trouble. At the beginning, they were courteous and considerate in their dealings with the natives, but the tribesmen took that as a sign of weakness and gave the team very little cooperation. Then they tried being a bit tough and found themselves with a small war on their hands. They were lucky to get away with their lives. So you can see why I'm pleased with the way things went off today. If the natives are that touchy, we'll still have to be careful, Sweet said. What are we supposed to be doing here anyway? Bruckner looked carefully around the circle at each of his listeners. There's no reason now why I shouldn't tell you, he said confidingly. The survey team found enough traces of rare elements here to suspect that there might be large deposits on the planet. That's what we're after. And you think there might be trouble? Majeski asked. Bruckner had his full attention now, Sweets noted. There was always a kind of leashed vitality about Majeski that made him poor company during a space trip, but he was the type of man you'd want on your side in a rough and tumble. I certainly do not, Bruckner answered, frowning in annoyance. It's my job to see that we don't have trouble. I went very carefully over the records of the two previous landings, even before we began this trip, and I believe I understand the psychological compulsions of these tribesmen quite well. You mean you know what makes them tick? Majeski asked. Yes, I think I can safely say I do, Bruckner said modestly. Their culture pattern is based on a long history of tribal conflict, and for a tribe to prosper, they must have a strong as well as resourceful leader. Thus the splendid dress of their chieftain this morning, in contrast to the drabness of the ordinary tribal dress. He must be, very apparently, a man above the common tribesmen to hold their respect. And that, Bruckner added, was the reason for our little act this morning. The best way to impress them with our power is to display the magnificence of our leader. The better we can keep them convinced of my greatness, the less risk there will be of trouble. Big Stoop, someone gave their pet the name the first five minutes and it stuck, had the run of the ship. Individually and in groups, the crew took turns amusing themselves with him, and Big Stoop accepted everything they did very seriously and loved the attention. He was definitely a gregarious animal and his name fitted perfectly. His gullibility and invariable stupidity seemed to have no limits. He fell for the same practical jokes over and over again. He was clumsy and stumbled over furniture, loose objects, and even his own feet. He would eat anything. If what he swallowed proved indigestible, he would stand for a minute with an astounded expression on his hairy face, and then whatever he had eaten would come rolling up. He eagerly gulped down the same rubber ball a dozen times in the space of ten minutes. Whenever spoken to, he replied promptly in his incredible squawking bray. A hello by one of the crew, with an answering bray from Big Stoop, was always good for a laugh. Big Stoop had a fear of loud noises, and pulled a variation of the ostrich head and hole routine at every unexpected loud sound, of turning his back to whatever had frightened him, and peering cautiously back under a flipper. If a tail feather was pulled, he'd make a determined and prolonged effort to run straight through the ship's wall, flapping and treadmilling and skidding and pushing his beak against it. Another of his tricks was the dispensing of pebbles, which he seemed to consider very valuable gifts, from his marsupial pouch to the crew members who took his fancy. Sweets often wondered how an animal with so little common intelligence had survived the evolutionary process. 
He could spot no counterbalancing ability or survival characteristic, but somehow the species had escaped extinction. On the second day, Bruckner sent Sweets and Teller, the head engineer, to the chief with a present and samples of rare ores. Sweets' duties on the trip out had included the learning of the native language. The sun was hot and Sweets wore only his shoes, trousers and a t-shirt. It seemed absurd that a sun that appeared no larger than an egg should be so hot, but he knew it generated all that heat because it was a blue sun, and not one of the ordinary yellow-white type as it appeared. The deceptive appearance was caused by the heavy atmosphere that held out the ultraviolet and the heat and light came in on the yellow band. Last night, the darkness had a dim violet haze. The interview with Chief Faffin went quite smoothly. He received the Earthman with great cordiality, and Sweets was certain that he detected in the chieftain's manner more than mere courtesy. He seemed to have a genuine liking for them. He accepted gravely the gyroscope top which Bruckner had sent and agreed, without argument or reservations, to send his men in search of the oars that matched the samples Sweets showed him. He would be happy to assist his friends, the Lassigule, the chief said. Lassigule was the native's name for the earthmen, used in both the singular and the plural. The same afternoon, a dozen natives brought samples of oars to the ship. At Bruckner's orders, Sweets gave each native a comb from the ship's supply of trading goods. During the evening, Teller and his men set up a portable mass spectrograph separator at the mine site, and three days later, they had the hold of the ship two-thirds full. During all this time, the crew members had been restricted to the vicinity of the spaceship, and by the third day were showing signs of unrest. They sent Sweets to talk with Bruckner and the captain. We'll be leaving here in a few days, Sweets told them. It's been a long trip out, and it'll be another long trip back. The men feel they're entitled to some fun before they go. That seems like a reasonable request, the captain said. What do you think, Mr. Bruckner? It would be risky to let them mingle too freely with the natives, Bruckner advised. We aren't familiar enough with the local customs. One wrong move might spoil all the goodwill I've been able to build up so far. Unless you let them have a little fun, you're going to be awfully unpopular, Sweet said. Without knowing it, he was something of a psychologist himself. Hmm, Bruckner was thoughtful. I'm for the men, he said finally. One hundred percent. Let's say we wait until tomorrow evening, though. We'll have the hole just about filled by that time, and it won't matter too much if the natives change their minds about letting us take the oars. How does that sound to you? Fair enough, Sweets agreed. The next evening, a full-fledged party was held. Permission had been obtained from Chief Faffin for the crew to visit the village, and the tribesmen were waiting for them when they arrived. Sweet stayed close to Majeski. For the past couple days, the big crewmen had been drinking, not heavily, but steadily. The irritation of being restricted to the ship and vicinity, added to the long trip out from Earth, had gradually built up in him an ugly resentment. Now as the crew members sat in a circle watching the dancing of a half-dozen native men, Sweets noted that Majeski was drunk. He sat with his arms wrapped around his legs, his head resting on his knees, and glared at the dancers. Outside the circle, a pile of brush burned with much crackling of wood pitch. After the dance was over, the natives sat solemnly watching the earthmen. It was soon apparent that they expected their visitors to furnish the next portion of the entertainment programme. Evidently, Bruckner had come prepared for this. He rose impressively from his throne on which he had been carried the quarter-mile from the ship, and said, "'We'll have your song now, Billy.' Billy Watts, astrogator of the crew, pulled himself to his feet, and in a high, boyish tenor sang, "'I'll take you home again, Kathleen.' Sweets felt his throat quicken as a wave of homesickness went through him like a chill. At the song's end, it needed the yip-yip-yip of the tribesmen's applause to bring him out of his memories of earth. The tribesmen continued their applause until Watts rose again. Sweets wondered if they had any music of their own. The men had danced earlier without accompaniment, and they had made no sound themselves. Billy Watts sang two more songs, and it was the tribesmen's turn again. Suddenly, a native woman ran out from behind one of the round, mud-packed village huts and into the circle of spectators. She paused on tiptoe, crouched and sprang upward, twisting and screaming as she rose. She landed with her legs in driving motion and went through a racing, energetic series of gyrations. She was almost completely unclothed. For a stunned moment, the men sat motionless in pleased surprise. Then Sweets caught a movement from the corner of his eye and shifted his head to look at Majeski. For the first time in many days, Majeski appeared happy. 
He had straightened up and his eyes shone with a glow of approval. He raised his arms in a gesture of encouragement and yelled, Swing it, baby! The dancer's stride broke and her head turned sharply in Majeski's direction. Then she ignored the interruption and went on with her dance. But Majeski was not to be ignored. He climbed to his feet and stood with his head hunched between his shoulders, watching her. Then he lurched forward, caught the girl up in his arms and swung her around in a staggering circle. It had happened too suddenly for any of the Earthmen to stop him, and now they were unable to decide just what they should do. Most of them turned to Bruckner. To Sweets, it seemed that Bruckner had gone pale, but it was difficult to be certain in the uneven light cast by the fire. His mouth opened twice before he could speak, and when he did, Sweets almost laughed at the staginess and absurdity of what he said. Unhand that woman, Bruckner commanded. Bruckner's voice was loud and it penetrated through the haze of Majeski's drunken elation. He stopped his spinning and set the girl on her feet, but he kept his right arm around her waist and glared back at Bruckner. Go to hell, he said. The natives apparently had been as surprised as the crew, for they had not moved. Now, however, one of them rose and lunged at Majeski. Majeski's face twisted into an expectant grin and he tossed the girl aside and stood with widespread legs, waiting. As the native dived in with his head lowered, Majeski brought his right fist up in a powerful uppercut and smashed it into the tribesman's mouth. The native continued his dive and landed face down. Natives and earthmen were on their feet now and moving toward Majeski. Sweets reached him first. The grin of pleasure was still on Majeski's face as he hit Sweets on the left cheek and spun him half around. He butted his head into the chest of the next man to reach him, but they pulled him down then and held him helpless. The natives had paused when they saw the earthman grab Majeski. Now Bruckner made his voice heard above the noise. Bring him over here, he yelled. Two men pinned Majeski's arms while a third held one kicking leg. They dragged him over to Bruckner. You damn dumb fool, Bruckner cursed fervently. He raised his voice. All of you, he ordered. Back to the ship. The natives made no attempt to stop them. Sweets glanced back over his shoulder at Chief Faffin as they went. He was standing and intoning sadly, Lassigul, Lassigul, Lassigul. The following day, Bruckner called Sweets to his quarters. That was a rotten piece of business last night, Bruckner said, but I'm proud of the way you acted. You did some mighty quick thinking there. Sweets grunted. He knew the flattery was leading to something. I've been giving the matter some deep thought since, Bruckner continued, and I don't think it's too late yet to patch things up. But I need a man with guts, he laughed. How brave do you feel this morning? Sweet shrugged and regarded the other levelly. You can speak their language, Bruckner said, and I don't believe they're sure enough of themselves to risk bloodshed. How would you like to bring another present to the chief? I'll see that you're... I don't feel like being a hero this morning, Sweets interrupted. Why don't you go yourself? Bruckner's eyebrows raised. My job is vital to the success of this expedition to risk my life unnecessarily. I'd go myself except... Except that it's too dangerous, Sweets finished for him. Bruckner straightened and his lips grew narrower. That will be enough of that. We'll find some way to get along without your help. The party Bruckner organised to visit the native village pointedly did not include Sweets. Each man carried a rifle and sidearms. Bruckner walked this time, at their head but Sweets made a small bet with himself that Bruckner would stay close to the protection of his men. He was willing enough to send another man out alone, but when he had to go himself, he made sure that he was well protected. Bruckner and his men had been gone almost an hour when Sweets heard the sound of Big Stoop's horse squawking from outside the ship. There seemed to be anger in the tones. Before Sweets reached the open portal of the ship, he heard more excited squawks. They were similar to Big Stoop's, but they weren't being made by him. Outside, Sweets found Big Stoop facing three others of his breed, exchanging loud, angry squawks. Soon they began to walk rapidly in their pseudo-dignified spraddles, each in a small circle. Abruptly, they were locked together, and it was soon apparent that this was no game. Big Stoop pulled with both flippers at the head of one of his visitors, while another systematically raked his long claws down the sides of Big Stoop's neck. Before Sweets could reach him, the neck was streaming with blood. Sweets remembered how Big Stoop had always been afraid of loud noises, and he raised his voice in a shout. The other Stoops turned their backs, but Big Stoop brought one flipper around and hit Sweets squarely between the eyes. As Sweets stood stunned, 
He felt Big Stoop's body crash against his shoulders, and this time, when he yelled, it was in alarm and fear. Then he was free, and his eyes swam back into focus. He saw Big Stoop standing with his back turned. The three visitors were shambling off awkwardly. Sweets left Big Stoop and stumbled back to the ship. Bruckner returned, well pleased with his trip. I'd say we handled that exactly right, he said. I don't know if the other expeditions contacted this particular tribe or not, but at least stories must have reached them of the potency of Earthmen's weapons. When we showed them that we preferred peace, but were ready to fight if necessary, that was the end of the affair. And the presence we had for Fafin and for the native that Majeski hit didn't hurt any. The one thing to keep in mind is that we've got to make them respect us. And those lads have plenty of respect for Lassigule right now. It seemed that Bruckner was right. There was no further difficulty with the tribesmen as the engineers completed their mining and separating operations and finished filling the hold of the ship. Two days later, they were ready to leave. Can we take Big Stoop along with us when we go? One of the crewmen asked Bruckner. Most of them were standing outside the ship, taking a last look around at Waterfield's planet. The ship had been made space ready, and all preparations for departure had been completed. I see no reason why not, Bruckner answered. He certainly helps keep our morale up. I wonder, he went on in an expansive mood, if you men realise why you get such a kick out of Big Stoop. You ought to read Hobbes' essay on the basis of humour sometime. Hobbes does a fine job of showing that we enjoy humour because it caters to our need for self-approval. When a monkey falls out of a tree, all the other monkeys laugh because it makes them feel so clever and wise for not having fallen out of their tree. Whenever Big Stoop pulls one of his outlandish stunts, we are all reminded of how much smarter we are. It makes us feel good, and so we like Big Stoop. We like anybody or anything that makes us feel superior. A few of the natives who had been watching the preparations for departure from a distance walked closer. Bruckner turned and waved cheerfully to them. Farewell, friends. Perhaps we'll see you again in a few years. He paused. I've been wondering, he said, pointing at Big Stoop. What's your name for this bird here? Lassigule, the native answered. They left Big Stoop behind. Thanks for watching and listening to this video. For more science fiction and fantasy stories like these, make sure to subscribe to this channel and check out the videos appearing on screen now.